Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing. From the City of Angels in Los Angeles, welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver at caregiverdave.com, along with my lovely co-host, former mayor of a California beach town and best-selling author, Debbie Peterson. Also coming to you live and on demand 24-7 on numerous syndicated radio and podcast networks on 26 global audio and video platforms, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, or Stitcher Radio, the list goes on and on. And we have just made number one caregiver podcast on Feedspot out of thousands, and number one on uh, Player FM, and number one on CaringVillage.com. So we are proud of that, and we have an especially exciting show planned for you today. We have speakers of the Global Caregiver Network which I am one of them. Let me just introduce a couple of them here. We're expecting one more who hasn't showed up yet. So family administrator and home care consultant, Mary Beal is trusted for her expertise in administrative legal services, caregiving and natural wellness. She has created a multifaceted company that at its core is about caring for people and leading with love. From reviewing legal documents to researching family history to recommending a vitamin regimen for a bedbound senior, she is a single stop shop for the supportive services that help families to stress less and focus more on what matters. Um, her beginnings were humble, but her family was wealthy in wisdom. Raised by women who were self trained in natural remedies and caregiving, Mary saw firsthand how the most potent medicines came from God's earth and a family's love. So, uh, our second guest, who is not here yet, is Tony. Gitless, and she's widely recognized for her dedication to personal personal development and her ability to inspire and guide individuals through life's challenges. And her books and speaking engagements have touched the lives of countless people worldwide. And she's a keynote speaker, workshop facilitator, support group mentor, and advocate for caregivers. And Etel, I don't think I have your bio. Why don't you briefly tell us who you are? I'm Dr. Etel Lord. I have offices in Maine and in California. I'm the founding president of the International Caregivers Association and the creator of a new business model for dementia care that I entitle Transactional uh, Dementia Intelligence uh, for uh, businesses. Uh, because uh, over 20 years of research, writing, and uh, learning from my husband that I took care of for 21 years with vascular dementia, uh, I found that um, the me missing piece in dementia care and in, uh, institutional uh, settings, whether it's assisted living, even home care and um, and uh, nursing homes. And so I created that program for that to meet, meet the needs uh, that were missing in that, uh, in that uh, uh, industry. Right. And um, why don't you guys, we'll start with um, Mary, tell us how you got involved with the uh, Global Caregiver Network. How did you meet Cheryl Mims? I met Cheryl Mims through another uh, acquaintance who is, also has a podcast, so Men Less Talk. So he saw her announcement and said, Mary, I think this is something you would be interested in since he knew my background. Uh -huh. And that person is Kelvin Vaughn of Men Let's Talk. He introduced me through cyberspace. Wow. And what about you, Atel? I, I, I'm also her mentor. I mentor uh, Cheryl Mims. Um, and uh, I met her while well, she was putting out her advertisements. And, and I was very interested in, in, especially in her enthusiasm. She has a lot of energy. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then she needed uh, some guidance and mentoring, and I offered uh, my services to her. And so she's one of my uh, very best clients. Wow. And how did I meet her? I, somebody introduced me to her, and they says, you know, you'd be a great speaker at this event. And it had just passed. I guess she does it every six months or so. And so uh, we are 
all speaking at the event. It's November 10th, mm -hmm. 11th, and 12th. Yes, it Saturday. starts on the 10th. Yeah, we're going to 11th, 12th, yeah. which is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'll be speaking Friday because I'm going away on a men's retreat later that afternoon. So that's the only time that I can speak. And um, it's just going to be an amazing event. Is this your first time on, on uh, or event? Have you been there before? Either one of you. I've been there. <clears throat> I think both of us have. That's where we met. Maybe you can explain what it is and what people can get out of it. Well, I'd like to speak a little bit. I think you get you get a variety of people, whether it's the from the medical model or social model of care. Uh, it's very interesting. You get people from all over. Uh, the last time I heard you speak, uh, Dave, that's how I connected with you because <laughs> you made me laugh so much. And uh and there are moments of, of laughter for sure, and we need to take advantage of them uh, because there's so many other moments that are stressful and uh, even depressing. I did the first one. I think I did just one. Uh, of course, my model of care is uh, social. I, ch I changed everything from medical to social because dementia care is not about, it's not an illness. It's a condition. And we need to treat people as though there's absolutely nothing wrong with them, except they like to communicate differently. And we have, that's why I call it dementia intelligence. People need to get more uh, study, study the, uh, how to communicate better. And uh, matter of fact, it's going to be on my website, uh, the definition of transactional uh, dementia intelligence. And I'll show examples of what I mean by that. I love that. That's it. In many ways, it's almost as if you learn a different language, isn't it? It's it, just is, it is. It uh, is. You know the world. first. Yeah, the first thing I ask people when uh, they call me from uh, organizations and they want to adopt the model, I ask them, "Do you know how to speak Alzheimer's?" I've never heard one <laughs> say yes yet. Yeah. Not one. So that's good. You know what? I used to be a mental health counselor in private practice, and I used to clap when I heard people get married and they go to the altar and they get married and then they say. And now you are one. I said, oh, I'm going to have business for the rest of my life because they were one and now they are two. And uh, they, they reverse that. And of course, nobody can be one with two people. You really have to just get along and learn how to survive. <laughs> so, so when they say they can't speak Alzheimer's, I think, well, that's wonderful. That's one of my clients. So. I wanted to go back to Mary, if that's okay. I um, lived in Scotland for 20 years, and my primary care doctor uh, one day said to me, well, have you got dandelions in your yard? They're really good for whatever it was that was bothering me. Go out and eat a few of your dandelions. Of course, not if I put dandelion killer on them. But, yeah. um, but when I lived there, people were much more into um, – alternative and natural care. And when my mother would visit, she got very excited about it and went home to California and bought 17 acres, started an herb farm with a 1200 square foot greenhouse and started growing all the Mediterranean herbs and, uh, and working with aromatherapy oils. And so I'm fascinated by what you've said, Mary, and I'm wondering, uh, you said that uh, you you know that there are some some very natural ways of healing and so i'm curious what what are they what what's your favorite what's your favorite what's the best well this time of year my favorite is eucalyptus hmm you know the, the eucalyptus tree well no not only the smell of that see i lived in africa for a while and then i saw one day this gentleman he says i said what are you doing he says i'm getting ready to clear my head so i can go out tonight i say what do you mean <laughs> so he showed me you know, he took some eucalyptus leaves, poured some water, poured it over the eucalyptus at least, and got a towel and wrapped the towel around the bowl wow. and his head. And he did Damn. the steam. And I saw all of this, this congestion come out of him and momentarily. And he was like a new person. And I said, wow. I mean, that that was one. But I had a <laughs> okay. That's why I have eucalyptus essential. <laughs> when it changes... But the change of season, you, uh, you need it. Yes. The change of season, you need uh, eucalyptus helps open up your, your breathing. You can breathe better. And, uh, but with the steam, it helps your eyes. It helps wow. all of this in here. So that's one of my favorites. Um, so, mm -hmm. And I share that with basically everybody I meet. That's the simple fix for, for sinus congestion. Yes, and I recommend sinus oil, which is a natural 
supplement made here in Maine. Uh, it will clear everything, including your lungs. What's in uh, it? Oh, there's several things. I'm not sure. I have a herbalist on my team, so and she has yeah. over 50 years of experience. Anybody can contact me. I'll put them, them in contact yeah. with her. I have a lot of sinus issues, uh, post nasal drip. You know, oh, that all goes away. Allergies. It up, uh, it's <laughs> terrible. Yeah, allergies mm -hmm. will go away. I want to tell you, uh, Debbie, my husband was on no less than 12 medications when he got vascular dementia. I was able to take him off everything, including uh, beta blockers, antidepressants, anxiety medication, you name it. And everything was replaced with natural uh, supplements. And he survived, you know, 21 years easily. It's incredible. You talked about there being, there is a missing piece. Yes. What, what's the missing piece? If oh. you see me looking down, you guys, it's because I'm taking notes on what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> Well, the missing piece is what I I uh, I actually did the work myself while I was in three different homes uh, to test my model, and the missing piece was a dementia coach, a dementia coach that's double certified, and by that I mean it needs uh, professional coaching training and professional uh, dementia training, dementia care training. I had both, and so I I played the role of both. And what happened is when there was an emergency. With a patient, maybe somebody, I remember this fellow that was following me down the hall and he was almost in tears and was getting very agitated. And I said, let's go back to the nurse's station. And we went back and she said, uh, but his problem was that he wanted to uh, call his brother, but his brother died. And uh, so the nurse, I said, what is the brother's name? So he was pounding on the on counter. I want to see my brother. And um, I said, let me show you what I would do. And uh, I immediately started pounding with him. I named the brother and I said, you love your brother, don't you? And he loves you. Immediately, the energy went down. He stopped pounding and he was satisfied as though he had talked to his brother. He wanted some reassurance and um, things like that. Um, people starving because they were <clears throat> hitting uh, nurses. They wouldn't go near them. They were afraid. Uh, there was one sitting down and he was losing weight because he wasn't eating. And I was able to uh, put them <laughs> as the nurses to sit back and look, look how I would resolve that uh, with somebody with dementia. It's to simply always have eye contact. So I have eye contact with this person and he started smiling. I smiled after him. And then he started pointing to me because he was recognizing that I was a person with compassion and I started pointing to him until our fingers touched. And I sat next to him. I said, please bring his food. And I fed him. So, so it's, it's very much doing what they're doing, modeling what they're doing. Uh, you always food. have to, to follow first. And then you may lead after. You never lead first. But what happens in, in those uh, places, uh, either assisted living or nursing homes, they're in a hurry. They don't have anyone, you know, enough people. So they don't bother to even look at them sometimes and explain things. And, you know, it's a little bit slower for somebody with dementia to process the information. The information. So you have to slow down. And uh, so they, they hurry. And uh, that's what gets people to be very anxious. You know, we're born with four basic feelings, uh, sad, glad, mad, and scared. And that's something we express from birth till the time we die, whether we have dementia or not. They're allowed to do that. So those feelings are expressed and uh, people do not realize that uh, they have the right to express those feelings. Uh, it's just the care provider that's not properly trained, not enough uh, dementia intelligence to uh, really take care of them. It's a specialized uh, form of care. When my parents got older, I, I trained as a certified nursing assistant and worked for a few years in a, uh, a care home because I wanted to know how to take care of them when they got older. And yeah. it was wonderful that I, but I also have a degree in communication and I would slow down and I would talk to the people and look them in the eye. That, it wasn't so much the dementia patients, although I did that with them as well, but it was the patients that couldn't communicate, didn't have speech anymore. And every time they would start to cry, I would just talk to them about what I knew about their life and what they'd accomplished and how much, how impressed I was and how I knew people loved them. And um, it, it just, it was amazing to me that 
they were there. They were there, but no well, one ever took the time. Yeah. Yeah, my husband lost his voice completely as well, but he's still related. It's important to measure, and this is one thing we do in our program, we measure the level of engagement of that person, whether they can talk or not. And what we found is that uh, to do that at the very beginning uh, will hold them in that pattern for many years. Uh, otherwise, they start to deteriorate very fast. Mm. So that's one way to keep them engaged is, and, and to know what level should we keep them engaged. Welcome, and Tony. Her. How do we pronounce your last name? Welcome. My name is Tony Giddles. Giddles. I was Rhymes with Skittles. <laughs> and I, I mentioned your, your biography, but tell us how it is that you met Cheryl and how you got involved with the Caregiver Global Network. Great. Well, I took care of my mother from 2003 to 2017. She was 89 at the time she had a health care crisis. And the neurologist told me at that time, we had been in the hospital three weeks, that if she survived, she would never live independently again. And she did live, and I got scared, <laughs> even with my healthcare background. And knowing some resources in the community, you know, when you're in a crisis, it's difficult to think what to do. But I did get her home and started to figure things out, and eventually put her in a uh, moved her to an assisted living facility. She actually did fully recover, and it was the morphine that she was on that was causing a lot of the problem. Now her oh. the MRI of her brain didn't look that good either. So I, I think the neurologist knew what he was talking about, but mom recovered and she lived out her life in an assisted living facility, but uh, she lived to be a hundred and there were <laughs> many medical issues, many, many, you know, unexpected issues at that time. I started my company after mom died to help fellow caregivers because the journey was so stressful and I figured there had to be a better way uh, for people to go through this journey. Uh -huh. And the two things I came up with were when they needed, you know, if I had had somebody to talk to throughout that time who had been a caregiver, it would have been so much easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, you know, I, when I left the hospital, there was no guidebook. There was no resource. <laughs> And we were we're on our own. So I wrote the book okay. finally. What's the name <laughs> 20, of it? Twenty one mistakes caregivers make. And Only twenty one, huh? Oh, <laughs> well, that's I've people have said that to me, and I said I had to stop somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> volume because, one, yes, volume <laughs> one. So solutions wow. and strategies to help people reduce stress, but also increase happiness. I'm a happiness trainer, and yeah. I think one of the things that had me survive was using the happiness principles and uh, having a positive outlook, learning the lessons and just figuring things out. I found my strengths. So how I met Cheryl, um, I've been doing uh, consulting. I've been doing workshops, a lot of virtual since COVID. And I just found Cheryl one day <laughs> who was doing some great work and we connected and had an interview and you know, we hit it off right away. I mean, we're all doing good work in the caregiver industry, but there's a lot of people who don't know about us and don't oh, know where to go for help. This isn't your first global caregiver network, uh, is it? Did you speak as a before? speaker? Yes. Your first? Yeah, as yes, a speaker. Mine too. Mm -hmm. So, Mary, yeah. I, I asked you before. I don't know if you answered it. Um, uh, what did you talk about uh, during the last uh, seminar? Well, I. What I talked about, I didn't, I wasn't on the, the seminar, the big this seminar, I was just on with the group. Yes, this is my first also. Okay. But what happened, I was a caregiver for my mother also, mm -hmm. and from 2005 until 2011. And being her caregiver, I learned a lot, but it, mine took a different, different type. I wrote a book about my mother. Because she reached 100 while I was being her caregiver. Wow. She lived to be 101 <laughs> in seven months. Oh. But she she had been a caregiver, so she, she was easy to, to, to <laughs> <laughs> take care of. Because she could tell me what to do. <laughs> you know, she, I didn't have to go outside to get instruction on what to do. But she was still alert. She was mentally sharp um, on her deathbed. She... Um, 
Mm-hmm. She just was an exciting person to be around. She had humor. She still was active, attending church, attending family functions. So wow. she was an active person. But the doctors, after she had a fall, I think about age 93, they didn't want her living alone because she was living alone in her own house. And she had been used to a lot of people. She raised 10 children her own, and then she turned around and raised eight grandchildren. (laughs) So she had the empty nest syndrome, so she wanted somebody home with her. Why was she raising her her grandchildren? Weren't her uh, kids? Her her daughter-in-law died and left 11 children. Oh, my. (laughs) She outdid her mother. Yes. Yeah. No, her, she didn't do out her do her mother. Her mother had seventeen children, but oh she I did my oh. mother. <laughs> I used to think that's why women died young, but <laughs> obviously some women are made tough. <laughs> yes, they live to be a hundred. Well, my mother, my mother just came from a long uh, a line of longevity, she, it, it, you know, and so they were able to pass down certain things through through the generations. Because she told us as we were growing up that her great grandmother lived to be at least 112 because she said on her 12th birthday, her great grandmother was 112. So she had, uh, and she had several aunts to reach 100. She had what one was her diet? Her diet, we grew up on a farm and she, as I said, she, she had her own garden. She raised her own chickens, her own eggs. You know, she had a cow. She milked her, oh. we milked the cows. We made the butter. So we, you know, we didn't have a lot of uh, preservatives. We did canning. We canned our own fruits and vegetables. And, you know, it, it was a wholesome. Uh, How much of that diet are you on today? Well, I have to say at 77, I do pretty good. And I learned to can. So I can um, fruits and vegetables. I don't have a garden. My brother had a garden until last year. He transitioned at 89. But... Uh, I, I like to go out to the farm and get uh, fresh fruits and vegetables from the farm. And I stopped eating meat several years ago. I'll oh. eat I'll eat turkey every now and then, but I don't eat a lot of uh, processed food. Uh, I don't particularly like canned food. I'll eat it if necessary, but I try and eat fresh food as much as possible. Do you uh, do you have chickens? Do you slaughter and kill your own chickens? I have. I don't have any right now, but I have done that. And then, you know, I lived in Africa for, for three and a half years. <clears throat> and uh, when you go to the market there, you can go get fresh fruits and vegetables. And they would slaughter the chicken, but they would not uh, embalm the chicken. They would not take all the dinners out of the chicken. So, But I knew how, so it didn't stop me uh, because I had learned that on the farm. Well, you know, it's common knowledge that caregivers aren't the best people to take care of themselves, you know. Uh, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make him drink it. And that's, that's like describing a caregiver because many of them uh, are not well. 30% actually die before their loved ones do. 40% if they're caring for an Alzheimer's or a dementia patient die. And mm-hmm. the rest of them, you know, maybe 50% will become sicker than the ones they care for, eventually needing a caregiver of their own. That leaves about like 10% of healthy caregivers, which I think uh, that's represented right here. <laughs> what? How can you... Um, explain to the caregivers watching this why it's so important for them to tune in November 10, 11, and 12 and catch this, this uh, what is it called? A seminar? A, a symposium? Because um, I don't know how uh, Cheryl does it, but she managed to get 400 people tuning in uh, during the last one, which is amazing. Atel, you probably have been with her longer. What's her secret? How, what how did she do this? How did she put this together? You no, know, she has a tremendous amount of energy, but she also, uh, she doesn't just talk about it. She does it. Mm. Uh, and so she's a very trusting uh, a person that I trust, and, and she's very trusting to others. That's why she invites, uh, she's believable in what she says. And she also invites people that have experience like yourself, Mary and uh, Tony, and uh, that's important to have that. To go back to your subject of caregivers and the, and the health of caregivers, I've done a lot of research on that in writing. Uh, in my book, Alzheimer's Coaching, um, it's over 400 pages. I have two editions. I'm going to do a third one. And I'm going to write another book uh, called A Gift of Dementia, a gift uh, we have yet to unwrap. Uh, so uh, there is a, a caregiver 
fatigue timeline done. Uh, the research was done in Minnesota. It's very important to know that because listen, Dave, you're talking about people that work 24 seven. Tell me anybody that can do that and sustain. It doesn't good get paid and, and they don't get paid. So I found, you know, I found five different types of caregivers when I did my research. I write about them in the book. Um, so the fatigue, the caregiver fatigue timeline is something we need to pay attention to because you could end up with statistics, like you just said, and you don't want to do that. Uh, you'll you'll you can see the symptoms come up. When they come up, you can get some help. Uh, the ideal the ideal situation is if you can have families or other caregivers help you, you know, to do this work. But you know what? The reality relatives run away from you when they find out that you have somebody that is requires 24 7 they're even Notice afraid that, to knock huh? on your door yeah. because they're afraid you're going to ask them to do something <laughs> so i was pretty well alone um and let me tell you one of the techniques that i uh, and i tell that to somebody the other day i had forgotten about it <clears throat> in the middle of the night dave i would pick up my phone and dial just any 800 numbers that i could dial with my fingers just to hear a voice that's how bad it gets so oh. You know, we have to realize it's it's an impossible situation. It's getting better because, as Tony said, we have more information now. We didn't have that years ago. I mean, I had absolutely no information. I I remember going to the Alzheimer's Association and finding it was very limited. So I wrote a, a, a primer called uh, How in the World and Now What Do I Do? And I did that in four languages uh, just to help people because it was it was really crazy. Absolutely crazy. Wow. So who, who has something that they want to say that needs to be said and I didn't ask it yet? Well, I do. I, I, I didn't, you know, even though I had mother there to help me, I still needed some additional help. And the University of Georgia with the uh, corporate extension had a program where they taught a, a course on caregiving. And this is if I don't know if this can you can see this book. Can you see the book? Yes. Oh, who's the author of it? Uh, the yes, the caregiver help book. So I this helped me out a whole lot. So I don't know if in your area you have this. This was the second edition and and the legacy caregiver service. Uh you asked me who the author of this. It is uh all I can see is the leg legacy health system. Okay. When was it published, yeah. Mary? It was published in um, 2006. Yeah, before wow. my time. Yeah. 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 Have, <laughs> or after after book. my time, actually. Yeah. I have a similar book I recommend to people. It is just that big and just that thick. And it was written by a very dear friend, uh, Camille Superson. And it's the caregiver uh handbook on um oh my gosh i can i i gotta get the exact title why don't you talk amongst yourself and i'll see if i can find it because it's it's a good book it's uh how to get free food and free stuff and, and save money it's it's an encyclopedia on how caregivers can save money and get free stuff she has researched all over the place uh um local yeah. county state um uh, uh what's the 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 military uh va uh social mm -hmm. security all types of programs that caregivers do not have a clue about like That's did you know right. for example if you're a spouse of a veteran that they will pay for assisted living 100 percent. a lot of people don't know that there's so many secrets and hidden money and nobody's going to tell you about it because they don't really want to give it away but it's there and it's published and I'll go get the, the copy of that. Debbie, go ahead and ask the next question. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> I, I was really intrigued that as, as long ago, almost 20 years ago at the University of Georgia, that they actually recognized that need and put a course out there. That's incredible. I, I, you know, I had to go train as a certified nursing assistant to learn how to take care of my family. So, um, and I, I love how you did it, Mary, that you, because your family lives so long, just like you train your kids how to be, a, you know, you teach your daughter how to be a mother. Well, you can teach your family how to be a caregiver. What a great way to do it. <laughs> and, and we did not put her in a system. And she stayed at home in her own house or she lived with me for two years because I had not retired. But she was 
she was comfortable in her own home where her friends stopped by and it kept her going. And she had a friend, just to share with you, she passed last year at 109. She was the same way. 109. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> I want to drink some of that water. I know. So this is the Essential Resource yes. Guide for Caregivers. Um, save wonderful. time, save money, save your sanity by Dr. <laughs> Camille Supersun. And wow. this, is, this is a very thick encyclopedia type wow. of you are you broke? Most caregivers are broke. Most caregivers, you know, have lost their jobs because they can't do it all. Most caregivers uh, aren't getting the monies they're supposed to be getting. Uh, Social Security will actually pay you if you're caring for your loved one. You know, uh, there's lots of free resources where to get free food, etc. So keep that as a resource as well. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing yours, Mary. <laughs> Who else has something that they want to? Uh, Yes. I do. Well, one of the things that I didn't anticipate too much was having to become an advocate for my mother. Uh, she was in assisted living, but I really needed to know everybody that she came in contact with. Were they doing their job? You know, and she was well enough to report to me what was going on on a daily basis and was 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 accurate so that I could come in and talk to people. But you know, it's not that you can leave someone alone to their own resources. She wasn't a very good advocate for herself, but it, but she trusted me to tell me what was going on. And there were some employees that just didn't do do their job well, and especially if it came to the activities of daily living, bathing, that kind of thing. You know, that you want to be comfortable. You want your mother, your parent to be comfortable in that situation. The other area was in talking to physicians, and we certainly had a lot of them, had a lot of specialists because of the care she needed. Um, and I tried to never leave a conversation with a doctor not understanding, um, asking questions. I was an instructor at Baylor College of Medicine. It, it helped me a little bit to tell people that, but then they talked over my head. And right. I had to say, well, dumb it down a little bit because I'm not a doctor. <laughs> um, so that advocacy was important. And when I do workshops here locally in Central Florida, you know, I'm telling people we we probably can't change the healthcare system, but we can advocate step by step, little by little, and teach doctors what we need. Um, I eventually saw that neurologist again who told me my mother would never live independently again. And I told him what happened with her, that the morphine had caused a problem with her functionality. And when she was taken off of that, dis despite the MRI, she really did well and could have lived on her own. Yeah. I'm glad she was in assisted living, though, because I'm an only child. Mm. It would have been a lot of work. And I got a lot of calls at 7 a.m. that mom was being sent to the emergency room. So the help, the additional staff and the help was very useful. And now what we're doing in the community is trying to make Central Florida a dementia friendly community. Mm -hmm. We're training businesses and, uh, you know, about dementia and what, you know, what the people are like and how to interact with them. And a particular project is to train restaurant staff so that people have a place to take their loved one and can have some normalcy. Mm. Um, and, you know, we just need to get the people information out of their homes. But there's a specific time of day and day of the week that the restaurants set aside a time and they have to it has to be quieter than the normal, you know, busy times. And then also there's a company I work with, a travel agent that takes people on dementia-friendly cruises. And I am um, a co-chair of a conference on some of the cruises that we go on. Wow. And the, the family members, the caregivers, family members bring their loved one. And there's activities for the individual who has dementia, some form of dementia or even mobility issue. And then we have a conference for the caregivers, but it's all assisted. They're never alone unless they want to be alone. Yeah. We take them on the excursions. We're there if they need uh, medical care because we have a nurse on staff. Um, but and we're there to do support circles, support groups. Yeah. So and we're we're there to on a cruise, a real cruise, Holland America mm -hmm. Lines, to have a good time. 
So it's an amazing experience. And we're about to go to the Panama Canal wow. cruise out of Fort Lauderdale for 12 days. So we have a group that we're taking in October in about two weeks. How many in your group? Um, this group is about 20. Wow. Um, prior to COVID, she was taking like 60 people and and more on the cruises. So the staff, what does it roughly cost to go to the Panama Canal, for example? Um, I'm not sure. It's probably around between two and three thousand dollars per person. That's really cheap. Yeah, yeah. Now this is twelve days. It could be more. We've been on some seven day trips to the Caribbean. Mm. Uh, she also goes to Alaska, which is a beautiful trip. Yes, well I cared for other. my mother with dementia. She passed away. I cared for my mother-in-law. She passed away. Now I'm dealing with my mother's sister who has dementia. Now she yeah. found a boyfriend. She's 85. She found an 87-year-old boyfriend in her little independent uh, facility. And they're both uh, kind of have touches of dementia. And at times hers is worse. At times his is worse. They kind of care for each other. I, mm -hmm. I think they should go on a cruise. That would be great. Yeah. Now, well, we're, uh, we're, if if uh, caregivers would just get organized, you know, like the Alzheimer's Association is a great um, organization that raises lots and lots and lots of money, um, and you know they know what they're doing because if all the caregivers went on strike in this country, the <laughs> the billion dollar uh, industry of of you know care would they wouldn't know what to do; <laughs> they'd go bankrupt. And and a lot of people would suffer. Yeah, so, people uh, would die. That's where Doctor. That's where Mayor Debbie comes in because she's a former mayor and a former mm -hmm. caregiver, and she does a lot of stuff uh, helping, telling people how they can get involved in government. Why don't you talk on that a little bit, Debbie? And I'd like to well, talk after my Why? latest book. My latest book is something that every single one of you has done. It's called Local Impact. You can make a difference. And my focus has been to get involved in your local government because that's where you have impact. Um, but start. this book is just for anyone because any way you get involved in in your community, you will make a difference. So um, it's for people who've done what you all have or who to let them know that they can do what you've done. And they can make a difference and to give them some suggestions how to do it. I wanted to say I wanted to say something uh, after Tony uh, talked. Actually, my uh, my program uh, is is a revol revolution program in dementia care in the whole culture. We're changing the culture because we're educating uh, owners, administrators down to janitors. We want family members to join the team, a larger team of caregivers. And we want the dementia coach to be in the center of the organization, organizational chart. It becomes an executive position. So really, we can we can absolutely change the culture, and we're on the move. Mm. I love the organizational be chart concept. I I used to go yes. after quite a lot in local government because they would never put the people on top, and the government is the government of the people in a democracy. So I used to go in and insist that they change every organizational top, every organizational. Yes. Department. Yes. And you know, dementia care is very expensive, very expensive. And we've lowered the cost. We are able to uh, increase the return on investment. Uh, we reduced uh, the uh, turnover and the burnout in the healthcare uh, world. Wow. And um, we're educating everyone so that everyone uh, can do better. Uh, the dementia coach is actually being able to coach families that go in there and need some uh, some help. Uh, Tony was saying, you know, about her mother. Uh, I was the one hiring and firing the doctors. I was the pack leader. And that's the term I used in my book, a pack leader, because uh, I was the head of the pack. I had other people. I had the doctor, the nurses, the CNAs, uh, the janitors, everybody uh, but I knew my husband well enough, and I wanted to uh, put that program out to uh, uh, in the public and see how it worked. So that's what I did. Uh, it, it's tremendous, and the government is looking now for a new uh, a new uh, business model of dementia care, and I have it. That's wow. wonderful. It's amazing how fast time is going. Uh, I don't want this to get too long, or people won't listen to it. Thirty to forty-five minutes seems to be their sweet spot. Before they say, ah, I don't have an hour to listen to this. Anyway, take uh, 60, 30 to 60 seconds, each of you, and 
uh, tell us why uh, caregivers should tune into the Global Caregiver Network uh, November 10, 11, and 12. It's a virtual meeting. They don't have to travel anywhere. And uh, I'll start with you, Mary. The reason why uh, caregivers should tune in, they can pick up some great hints on to help them if they should become a caregiver or if they are already a caregiver. Because you need an outlet. You need to be able to tap into resources. And this is a good resource. It's a variety. Look at what we just shared this afternoon. And our mm -hmm. situations were different. I took care of my mother in home where, where um, Miss Gip Skittles <laughs> took care yeah. of her mother through assisted living. So that's different. Sometimes they are long distance caregivers. And sometimes you're the sole caregiver. And with me, I had siblings to assist me on occasion so I could get some rest. But when, you, when you're a sole person, you don't have someone to turn to say, can you catch this schedule? So it, you, you're going to learn a lot from just listening in because she has such a variety of resources in terms of people who have actual experience. Yes. I tell? Yes, I think they should turn in because uh, just like your book says, it's essential caregiving uh, assistance and it's free of charge. People can re register for free uh, and there'll be a variety of, uh, of, you know, if you're, if your framework is from a medical model, you'll see that if it's a social model, you'll see that as well. And I'm going to just speak on my model that I develop for, uh, for businesses and explain what it does. So it's really important that people turn in. Yes. Uh, Tony. Yeah, well, it, information is critically important to have. And I know during my support groups, during any conversation with a, with a caregiver, you know, I can learn something new, <laughs> even. There's a lot to learn, even in, the, it was a total of 14 years I took care of mom. But, you know, the wisdom that we have, because we've been paying attention, because we cared about the quality of care, we cared about our loved one, um, uh, so much information that it's certainly worth the time. Now they should take notes and then they should get an action around the things that they're most concerned or worried about. And this would be the place to go to get that information. Yes. And I've been caring for my beautiful wife, Charlene, for 27 years now, right in the middle of our 49 year marriage. And um, I got to tell you, I didn't even know what a caregiver was in those days. I didn't know what uh, anything was <laughs> and uh, this is not just for caregivers I mean you can be a normal person and then the next day boom you're a caregiver just mm -hmm. like you got your draft notice in the mail oh no now I'm drafted now I'm going in the army mm -hmm. or whatever and and that's what it's like we don't want you to be unprepared non-caregivers need to prepare how to be a caregiver because it's inevitable you will either become one or need one need or one. you're already one you know, exactly. and as uh, Jimmy Carter's wife used to say, uh, you know, there's four kinds. The other kind was uh, you used to be one, you know, well, you can be one again. So yes. uh, tune in and I'll be talking as well. Uh, and it is it is uh, you can't isolate yourself. You know, mm -hmm. you have to have a place to vent and you can't vent with your friends or your loved ones or they'll stop calling you. They'll stop coming by. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to be around Debbie Downer. You need a special group of people who understand <laughs> a support group and that way you can vent to them they can vent to you uh they're like-minded people support groups are essential and thank god for today because you used to have to drive miles to get a support group uh when i became a caregiver 27 years ago but now thanks to the internet uh they are right there at your beck and call mm. any last words you want to say debbie as a former caregiver Oh, just that this has been wonderful and I'm so thrilled and um, I, I highly encourage people to tune in and then also encourage people to, to start thinking now about how they might take advantage of Dave's trip to Acapulco. I, I did it last year and um, I will tell you it was, well, I'm going back. That's all I need to say. So check that out. Figure out how to do it. Start now. Yes, because I am offering in June a trip to Acapulco for caregivers and it costs a little more than than the cruise, but you know this is a high end uh, event, and it's seven days in paradise with other caregivers. It'll be a support group. Uh, mm -hmm. The food is just you know six star. Not really, it rises above five star, 
And um, there's just three hours a day of teaching from me and my book. Uh, it's your life to thrive and stay alive as a caregiver. The rest of the time is support. You're talking to each other. You're sharing stories. You're laughing. You're going in the pool. You're just doing all sorts. We've got a pool table. It's it's just an amazing, <laughs> amazing group. And um, uh, it, maybe you don't have the money to join it. Well, you know what? Everyone has siblings or relatives or brothers or sisters or parents or kids who do have money and uh, like you said they they run away when because uh, they're afraid you're going to ask them to do something they would much rather drop down a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars and send you away so that you don't <laughs> burn out so that you, they don't have to be a caregiver so this is an investment it's in true. making sure that you don't become a caregiver if you're a sibling of a caregiver or a mm -hmm. loved one of a caregiver um, it's uh, people will spend money on anything these days, you know, they'll go out and, uh, you know, go pay a thousand dollars for a concert. Well, give that thousand dollars to a caregiver who's burning out so that they can come back refreshed and rejuvenated so that you don't have to do their duties. Right. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. So with that, we will wrap this up. And I just want to remind everybody that, uh, we are the number one caregiver podcast out there and all our interviews including this one will become recorded podcasts on those 26 global audio and video platforms that i mentioned and um what else we've we you should go to caregiverdave.com uh, and find out all the things that are on there this radio show tools resources videos blogs and um there is another thing that is on there i am offering a free 30-minute coaching session for those who are just feeling like they can't go through another day. It just, you know, it doesn't take much to to reach out and get 30, wisdom, 30 minutes of wisdom. I call it Dave's Hammock Wisdom because I have a book, Secrets from the ha Hammock, Uncommon Wisdom for Uncommon Times, spreading wisdom all over the world. And it's available wherever books are sold and on my free membership site, caregiverdave.com. If you're struggling, go there and get some free coaching, 30 minutes of free coaching. And don't forget, I have a Facebook page, Caregiver Dave, 34,000 caregivers, lots of mm -hmm. tools, resources, videos, uh, support. And if you click the like or follow button on whatever platform you're watching this on, you can uh, help Google's uh, search engine algorithms, which will help us reach even more caregivers. So a true heartfelt thank you to all my listeners out there making us the number one caregiver podcast and radio show every Wednesday on the internet. So until next week, same time, same channel, may God richly bless you all. Bye-bye. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's Dave Nassani, otherwise known as Caregiver Dave. And I'm coming to you live from this beautiful Acapulco Villa, which I like to say is the perfect prescription for caregiver burnout. And I have a unique opportunity to bring 14 burned out caregivers up here so that they can decompress and do all the things that they need to do. But this is just a bonus. It actually comes with the six month Zoom coaching program. It's a one-on-one -on -one consult with me, Caregiver Dave, to identify where you are and where you need to go. It's six monthly small group coaching sessions to smash any obstacles between you and your ideal vision of what a caregiver needs to be and caregiver success. You get my three free books and instructions on boundaries, grief, self-care, organization, asking for help, learning how to say no, avoiding burnout, avoiding depression, avoiding perfectionism, avoiding isolation, avoiding resentment, delegation, team building, how to have fun, how to have no guilt, the importance of gratitude, and after caregiving when you're no longer a caregiver. But this seven day bonus is absolutely free. It comes with the coaching program that you pay for. And the food is all inclusive. I'm telling you, seven days and seven nights here is amazing. This is truly paradise. And I highly recommend it. For more information, just go to acapocodave.com. Thanks again. I look forward to seeing you in Acapulco. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. Uh.